and they oh. All right, we're gonna get started. So good afternoon, everyone, on behalf of the Afro Latina Latino Forum and the Black Latinas No Collective. Um, my name is Melissa Valle, and it's my honor to welcome you to the Afro Latina Latino Reader at 10, uh, a celebration of the 10 year anniversary of the Reader and the visionary work of editors Miriam Jimenez Roman and the late great Juan Flores. Uh, today, we'll be celebrating this tremendous text, the organizational work of this brilliant couple really showing some love to Miriam for her social, political, and intellectual contributions to Afro-Latinidad as a scholarly project and to Black Latinx people more broadly. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Saire Dinsi Flores and I, like Melissa would, and Josue Perea, who's um, behind the scenes running the controls, would like to welcome you to a much deserving 10 year celebration of the Afro-Latino Reader and its editors, Miriam Jimenez Román and Juan Flores. Afro-Latina, what's an Afro-Latino? Begins the text of what is truly a cimarrón volume. The term befuddles us, they write, quote, because we are accustomed to thinking of Afro and Latina as distinct from each other and mutually exclusive. One is either Black or Latina. The short answer, they explain, is quote, that Afro-Latino belongs to both groups. As straightforward as this definition would seem, the reality is that the term is not universally accepted and there is no consensus. The difficulties surrounding that we, and the we here matters, call ourselves reflect the complex histories of Africans and their descendants in the Americas. And this brings us to the long answer, they write. The long answer turns out to be a 566 page volume of historical import, analytical prowess and deep reflection. In Miriam's own words, the volume is quote, an eclectic mix of materials going from the personal essays to academic research including statistical and historical data. The Afro-Latina reader has a full range of essays that touch your heart and others that push your mind, giving you new ways of thinking of race and ethnicity. Its broad range explores the ways people think about and understand race, end of quote. Comprehensive in scope and honest and humble in spirit, no doubt reflecting its brilliant editors and dedicated contributors, the Afro-Latina reader becomes the main book, the Bible, so to speak, for the study of Afro-Latinos in the United States. If it was an album, we would be at the Grammys calling it a top selling, most listened to album. But its purpose and reach is far more pedestrian, much more del pueblo. And I dare say, politically and socially, collectively, this volume is much more relevant. In a 2012 interview for the Los, Afro, Los Afro-Latinos blog, speaking of the reader, Miriam describes some of the political motivations behind the reader. Quote, after the 2000 census was released, it basically posed Latinos and African-Americans in a black versus brown. And it gave the sense that the United States was evolving into this post-racial state. Latinos didn't have a concern about race because the census says Latinos, the largest minority groups can be of any race. And this is a demonstration of overcoming race. My co-editor Juan Flores and I were appalled by that kind of analysis. We're not in a post-racial state. Race is still a very important part of how all of us globally live our lives, end of quote. As attentive as it, is to our structural position in society, the reader also attends the heart, particularly in young innocence. As Miriam described it, quote, when we discussed how we would do this book, I said I wanted a book that addressed some of the concerns I felt when I was young. I grew up as a black Puerto Rican, and I'm very conscious how race and ethnicity have both impacted my life, end of quote. As a scholar, a writer, a teacher, a Black Caribbean Antillana myself, I've seen the volume's transformative power, the way it opens minds, forces us to ask new questions, dig for new insights. The impact and contributions of the volume go much further than its pages. It lives in the Afro-Latino Forum, 
the organization that Miriam and Juan founded in 2006. It lives in the Palgrave Afro-Latino series for which Miriam serves as an editor. And it lives in the accumulating body of scholarly, activist, cultural, and political work around Black Latinidad. It also inhabits the work of the recent Black Latinas No Collective, of which Miriam is a founding member, inspiration, and thought leader. I'd be remiss not to mention the centrifugal force that Miriam, in particular, is to Afro-Latinidad, Afro-Latino studies, and its intersecting fields, not to mention her friends. The lingering mark, the work, is precisely the elaboration, the formation, come to life, of a proud triple consciousness. Latino, Negro, American, that the editors post in their introduction. The Afro-Latina reader effectively foregrounds the fact of Afro-Latinidad, that is the distinctive and unique experience lived at a personal level by people who are both Black and Latina. We see this experience come to life in the reader and in the figure of Miriam Jimenez Roman and Afro-Latina Cimarrona in all sense of the word. With that, I come to, I welcome you to the celebration of the reader, its editors, contributors, and the work that has germinated and blossomed from it. Our first panel dives into the heart of the reader with just three of the 67 marvelous contributors to the volume. Our first uh, panelist is Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who contributed a piece titled called Reflections About Race by a Negrito Acomplejado. Uh, amazing title. Uh, and this uh, entry is in the ninth section of the reader, which is titled Living Afro-Latinidades. Our second contributor and panelist uh, presenting today is Evelyn Laurent Perrault, who contributed a piece titled Invoking Arturo Schomburg's Legacy in Philadelphia which lives in the second section of the reader dedicated to Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Our third panelist is Nancy Raquel Mirabal, who contributed a piece titled Melba Alvarado, El Club Cubano Interamericano and the Creation of Afro-Cubanidades in New York City. Nancy's piece appears in the section titled Afro-Latinas and the Color Line. Together, these contributions offer a glimpse to the wide-ranging scope and deep thought within the reader's pages. So Professor Bonilla Silva will start us off, followed by Professor Loren Perrault and then Professor Mirabal. Order a bit. So I think we're going to start with with Evelyn. Evelyn, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Um, uh, wow. <laughs> I was hoping not to be the first one. <laughs> it's always, I think, the hardest. Um, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. It is an honor to be here um, uh, celebrating. I can't believe it's already been 10 years. Uh, the anthology has been out. And I second... Um, the amazing introduction that you just uh, gave us of the, for this groundbreaking work that uh, at 10 years is still as vibrant and new as it was when it first came out. And, and, it, and the fact that it speaks to this relevance, uh, the fact that it's still so, so needed. So I'm going to follow a little bit the, the suggestion that you had sent to us. Um, I, and I would say, for me, this this ex the experience of the being a contributor to the Afro Latino Afro Latina reader comes from actually meeting um, Miriam Jimenez and shortly after uh, Juan Flores and 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 I will link that to my little piece um, and 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 underline the fact that my piece might be the shortest of the, the entire book and it was not. An academic uh, piece, it, it, but it, it reflected or, or to, a, to to what was um, meeting Miriam and Juan and, and the process of growing up, so it says, into the Afro 
Latinx um, activism and la later on scholarship. And so um, I met he Miriam Jimenez. Uh, she was the first presenter who came to an event that now is going to its 25th year at Taller Puerto Riqueño, which is an organization based in Philadelphia. And the event is called the Annual Arturo Chamber Symposium. And so I met Juan a few months later uh, after I met Miriam. And, and when I met them, I was actually a relatively newcomer to the United States, but I had uh, lived and worked for two years in West Africa and Cameroon and growing up black um, in Venezuela and Venezuelan. And I was born and raised there and I left Venezuela after I finished college. Um, it, was, it was a way, I mean, I was, First of all, acquiring a language to talk about racial dynamics in Latin America and Venezuela, where I'm from, and dealing with uh, what I was encountering among Latino communities in the United States. And, and having had the experience of living in two years in Africa, that had began to brought on me a series of questions concerning um, discrimination, racialization, but, ex but also about silences uh, concerning the contributions of Africa and African diaspora people to not only the United States, but mostly to Latin America, which is still to this day taboo, even though there's been a lot that's been accomplished. And so meeting Median at this uh, first uh, Chamber Symposium was an eye-opening. And I had been meeting people and talking about it, but meeting, and she came and spoke about uh, Arturo Chamber's life. And uh, shortly after that, Miriam and I began kind of, you know, the universe began to put us together in the same place. And that's how I met Juan. And uh, they, in a way, became to me kind of like uh, surrogate intellectual um, Afro-Latinx godparents. Um, as I was moving and trying to solve my own, my own questions and my own path. Um, and so... I was invited, and so we will bump into each other in conferences in Guadalajara, in Venezuela, in New York, in many different places, and our communication kind of will be got strengthened, and I, and I, I will, my own understanding will grow tremendously from um, what I will learn from them. And um, in series of circumstances led me to apply to graduate school eventually, and I was accepted at, in, at NYU in their history program in African diaspora. And at that time, then Median and Juan invited me to spend uh, at, at, at the time I needed to spend in their home. But it wasn't only to spend time in their physical home, but it was time spent with them in the, continuing that process of growth. And that's how they invited me to be part of the for Latina, for Latino reader. And so my essay was a very tiny, and it's a very tiny uh, rendition of how a group of us, Afro Latinos, Afro Latinas, uh, African American, be, took a series of informal conversation in, and turned it into a space in which, especially people of African descent from Latin America and Latino communities could speak out, voice out the sense of frustration um, because of this dichotomy of being white or black and or Latino being conceptualized as what I call the Dora the Explorer, everybody being brown and this monolithic brown experience. And, um, and so I talk about how we came up with the idea of having this space, not even knowing how was it going to be welcome and received. And, uh, and it's been a success. I mean, it's been going on for 24 years. And, but also at that time, it also provided a template to create an initiative called Encuentro, and uh, through which we continue organizing um, spaces to gather, to heal. Um, and, and, and in a sense, the Afro Latino reader also provide that space because those, some of us who were older and have been trying to process this experience have found ways to heal through this um, reading and through the event that I told you, that I talk about in the, in the Afro-Latino reader. So the, the symposium, that symposium and the Afro-Latino um, project and my little publication at the reader kind of paved the way for me into academia, which at that time when I first met Miriam Juan was not even 
in the horizon, even though my questions were, I, I understood later on, thanks to many people that were intellectual. So right now I have published an academic essay in Spanish in an anthology, another, another anthology that actually was recently awarded. And um, I have two other essays and I was just awarded some fellowships and I'm taking a sabbatical to complete my first book manuscript, which is has a tentative title of um, Claims of Dignity, Black political, black Women Political Imagination in Venezuela, uh, 1730s, 1809. So the whole process helped me become a historian and part of that process as well. I'm going to leave it up to there, not to take too much time. Thank you. Uh, and now, uh, Nancy Raquel Mirabal will offer her comment. Okay. So um, I made a point to write my notes because I know that I will go on and on and on and talk. So I just wanted to say that um, it really is a true honor to be here with everyone uh, celebrating this iconic and groundbreaking um, volume. I'm indebted to Miriam and Juan for inviting me to be part of this project over 10 years ago. And as I noted in my acknowledgments uh, to the piece on Mel Barbarado, uh, I really first learned about Mel Barbarado through Miriam. And I tell this story over and over and over again, but it's, and it's one that um, Miriam always, uh, you know, laughs about and we um, find really funny, is that when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, I went to the Schomburg, as everyone does, to do research on their dissertation. And I realized that I was working in a historical period where there was very little documents, very little resources, and almost nothing on Black women, on Afro-Cuban women. And so I went up to Miriam and Diana La Chantanet, who right now Diana La Chantanet is, is a great friend, and so is Miriam. But at the time, as a grad student, they really didn't pay much attention to me. <laughs> so I went up to her and I said, um, you know, I don't see any sources on women. And Miriam took me seriously as a graduate student and said, look, you know, there's this uh, particular person, her name is Mel Barbarado, she lives in the South Bronx, here's her phone number, good luck. <laughs> you know, and, and, and go talk with her. And so that's exactly what I did, is that I called Mel Valorado, who was working at the club. She was an organizer, an activist, and I said, can I interview her? And this was in the 1990s, and I, you know, I take the subway there. I'm in the South Bronx in the middle of July or August. I just remember it was super hot with those big recording, you know, none of this little phone, iPhone things. You're talking about having to carry this really heavy weight, you know, recording machine. And I showed up. And, um, of course, uh, Alvarado changed my life. And um, we became very close friends. And um, I really thank Miriam for that because had Miriam not – be willing to be as capacious, as open, as loving as she is with everyone, that would have never happened for me. And so I wouldn't be able to have written the book that I wrote, to be able to have the relationship that I had with Melba, to be able to do anything had Miriam not opened that door. So I'm completely thankful to Miriam for that. And um, we also had, uh, when I did the Schomburg in 2012, uh, Miriam was my neighbor. <laughs> so she was my neighbor. And what I loved more than anything was that I really looked forward to the times when Miriam was in her office because we would talk about everything. And she would challenge me when I would say, well, what about this chapter? What about this? And she would challenge me to think deeper, to think harder. And uh, I always tell a story that I gave her a copy of an article that had already been published. And um, I got it back marked in red. <laughs> so telling me how I could have made it better. The problem was that it had already been published. <laughs> so uh, I wish I would have had given her that article before because she absolutely made it better. And that's what Miriam does for us, right? She makes our work 
better. She makes us better. And I'm always so thankful with when I was in New York that Miriam and Juan would always invite me to their house in Brooklyn to have dinner, to have conversations. Um, this is someone who goes beyond the academy, who goes beyond the ivory tower to bring you into community. And she always bring me, brought me into community. And I was incredibly thankful to her. She even brought me sources on Mel Balvarado that I didn't have and said, look, you might want to look at this. So for me, in looking at this particular article, in short, you know, what does this article mean? What does this research mean? Um, and I, I worked with Alvarado for close to over 20 years. She passed in 1999. And we even did a, um, a wonderful event at the Schomburg for the 75th anniversary of El Club Cubano Interamericano, which was an Afro-Cuban club that she founded in 19, what was founded in 1945. And she was the president of that club for uh, twice. And I always say to me, Tay, that um, in many ways, Alvarado is the intellectual architect of my research, of my book. It's really important to me that I have her as the center of my work. And so there were several things that Alvarado did, which I'll bring in in just points. She was born in Mayari in Cuba in 1919, and she migrated to East Harlem in 1936. So she was living at a time, a historical period, that we often don't write about and that we often know very little about. So I did three major interviews with her and one um, is at the Schomburg and of course did um, a lot of informal interviews. So what did she do? She provided a template for a history that challenged the prevailing narrative of Cuban history in the U.S. One that is dominated by the Cuban revolution of 1959, the politics of exile, class, and whiteness. And in fact, if you examine the history of Cubans in the US before the revolution of 59, and as I argue in a later piece, even post 59, the 60s and the 70s, what you'll learn is that the history of Cubans is black, working class and revolutionary. Okay, that is really our history. And it is a white Cuban exile history that is the outlier. That is not the narrative. Um, this is also the case for 19th century history. It really is a history, if you look at it, and my book goes from 1823 to 1957, that is informed by the Haitian Revolution, by slavery, by emancipation, by blancamiento, by labor politics. It is not a history of white Cubans in New York. It is a very much more complicated history. It's also not a history that is just, you know, 1868 to 1898. It's also what happens to these black Cubans after 1898. And so that was also a history that allowed us, that Melba allowed us to really think about. And that was the history of El Club Julio Antonio Mella, right, of 1932. What does that mean? This is a club founded by black Cubans who were part of the labor organizing uh, with the IWO, who name a club, you can think about it, in New York in 1932 after one of the founders of the Cuban Communist Party. And those members of that club end up being um, organizing a Club Cubano Interamericano, right? So this revolutionary politics that black Cubans at that time are organizing. And also the club, the CCI, was a place where black performers would go. That's what it's most famous for, um, the jazz musicians and so forth, who would go to this club. So in many ways, Alvarado pop, you know, provides us a model of Afro-Cuban women activism and organizing. Um, she, her political views were incredibly transformative. She challenged sexism, racism, classism, um, and she was always opposed. Uh, it was one completely opposed to this exile, right? This white exile narrative that was overwhelming and in line with the Cuban revolution. So, and, and finally, just to end, I want to say that um, there are a lot of women like Alvarado. And so for me in doing this work is to do more work that speaks to, to the black Cuban uh, migrant community that was in New York, not only in the 19th century, but the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and experienced an incredible amount of racism, but, um, but still have a remarkable history that informs us to this day. And I wanna thank Miriam and Juan for providing me with uh, one of the few platforms to do this research and work. And as I told her uh, a million times, uh, it made all the difference. And we as a community continue to be grateful to her and to Juan for having the vision to put this collection together. So thank you, Miriam, from the bottom of my heart. And I'm done. <laughs> 
thank you both for sharing. Um, and so throughout today's event, we'll be sharing some of the praise for the reader, Miriam Juan and the Afro Latino Forum that um, you all have recently shared with us. Um, the first praise post that we're gonna have is from um, Tiana Pichel. Let's see, get that one. So um, she says, there's no other book that touches my students on such a personal level, while also teaching them so much about Afro-Latinidad, anti-Blackness, and Black joy across the Americas and through a diasporic transnational framework. It is the most layered and most accessible text on this topic, and we needed it and love it. Can't believe it's been 10 years. So thank you for your genius and poder convocatorio. Miriam Jimenez Roman and Juan Flores, may you rest in peace. So thank you so much for sharing that, Tiana. And so next up, we're going to have our panel of a few members of the Afro-Latina Latino Forum. Um, the forum, as, as Zaide mentioned, was founded by Miriam Jimenez Roman and Juan Flores in 2006. The organization raises awareness of Latinxes of African descent in the United States. It advances the visibility of Black Latinxes through dialogue and action and promotes an understanding of the Afro-Latinx experience. The work is guided by a transnational perspective that recognizes the, the, the centrality of race in today's global reality and the struggle for social justice. So it is my pleasure to welcome Kwame Coleman, uh, Ryan Man Hamilton, Gwesneth Josue Perea, and Yamila Serley. So Kwame's gonna kick it off. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Uh, it's really lovely to see so many familiar faces. Um, and it's also a great honor to talk about uh, the Afro-Latino Forum, which was and is an organization that means quite a lot to me. Um, effectively, it, it raised me and I can explain what that means. So I'll just give like a really brief kind of overview of what the ALF is um, and what it was for me as first a college student, then a graduate student, and now a faculty member. And then I'll, I'll end by playing uh, a piece that I recorded with Miriam for my uh, 2017 album called Local Music. I bet you didn't know that Miriam was also a recording artist. So, you know, the link that I want to make is that, you know, the work that the forum has done, the work that the book represents, and the legacy that both uh, Juan Flores and Miriam Jimenez Roman carry is one where uh, culture making, um, cultural history, uh, critical thought, social politics, um, community involvement, um, rigor, and fun, basically. Uh, the ability to celebrate life are all linked. And so I found my own way to do that uh, through the forum and in whatever else I do with all these instruments back here. So uh, just really briefly, the background is, is that um, I was never really convinced by academia. Uh, I kind of entered academia to kind of keep out of trouble, to be honest with you. Uh, my father was a professional musician, but growing up under him, oh, he's a prof professional musician, a pianist from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, African-American who grew up around a bunch of Puerto Ricans. And it was very clear from the way that I grew up that somehow my father knew more about Puerto Rico, Cuba, Dominican Republic than people who actually grew up there. In addition to that, my mother is a Puerto Rican and Dominican woman. And so I grew up with the culture and the music of those societies, those histories, those islands, in addition to uh, you know, the dynamic mixture that is New York City. So the reason why I say I got into academia to stay out of trouble is because I grew up around all these terrible stories about what happens to musicians, you know, and how hard it is to find work and how um, dangerous the music industry can be for all sorts of reasons. Um, so I found that the, the space that I found in, in college, basically, at Hunter College, City University of New York, was one where I could kind of probe that and think about what that means and think about my place in it. And that's around the time that I met Juan. I met Juan Flores as his undergraduate advisor with a bunch of questions about everything. And he just tabled them and, and refereed them in that very kind and uh, jovial way that Juan Flores always did to all of us. I'm sure we all agree. But in all honesty, it was Miriam that I wanted to impress. So by the time I graduated with my undergrad degree, I had already met Miriam Jimenez Roman, who was Juan Flores' main collaborator main uh, idea shaper and, you know, partner in life. And um, I would spend time at their house in Brooklyn um, and we'd play records and we'd talk about graduate school and my plans for graduate school. Um, and uh, uh, more than that, 
the question of what does it mean to make music as a black Latino guy from Harlem? And I think with all of the questions and all the searching that I was doing, both Juan and Medium took an interest in me. And uh, Juan being my undergraduate advisor said, you know, you should really think about uh, participating in this initiative that we are beginning called our Afro-Latino First Project and then Forum, the Afro-Latino Project then Forum. And so I jumped on that opportunity and it was there that I found community, community with people who are in attendance today to really think through my identity and understand what uh, critical thinking plus my identity actually meant. But like I mentioned earlier, I was starting to understand what acad academia meant for me and I was applying to grad school. So long story short, um, I was accepted to a few, but the one that I decided to choose was Stanford University because of their uh, focus on music aesthetics, which is basically the kind of intellectual history and philosophical aesthetic concerns of music. So all that kind of heady stuff really interested me. I kind of found what I wanted to, to find. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, it was Miriam who I wanted to impress because she didn't let me go without a challenge. She said, well, seems like you're gonna to go to Stanford and all that. Um, don't come back like one of those people who goes to a place like Stanford. And I said, whoa, what does that mean? So <laughs> right from the very beginning, I had to confront that idea that there is something about these academic spaces that could sometimes um, prevent someone from engaging in the kind of uh, political and cultural uh, concerns and initiatives um, and efforts that can happen on the street and at the community level. And it took me some time to really understand how much of a challenge that that Midi had uh, kind of cast on me. You know, it was almost like a, you know, you know, as though she was like a spiritual advisor kind of giving me, you know, that 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 zap that I needed to kind of like understand what the real path is. So, um, you know, I went through grad school and I found my way. Um, but uh, it, every time I would come back to New York from California, and it was in California that I also met uh, Nancy Mirabal, so so wonderful to see you. Um, it was there that I linked up with people from the ALF and conversed about the things that mattered and really found my own connection between art practice and cultural history and identity. So. That's what the ALF meant to me. And, you know, I don't have a piece in the book, but I was part of the entire genesis process of the book as, as a kind of participant, a volunteer, someone who cared very much for the project and saw all the amazing uh, contributions that people have put into it. And it's a book that I am very proud to have seen uh, take shape and, of course, own and refer to. So with all that said, I'll close by playing a piece that I wrote or I created for Miriam, because as I mentioned, she left me with that challenge and it's still a challenge that I feel like I had to live up to. So when I was putting together music for my album, I said, you know what? Yeah, naturally there are all these musicians, including my father who have been such a big influence to me and I tried to refer to them musically throughout the album, but I want to include one person's voice because there are a few people's voices in the album. It's called Local Music. So it's about where I grew up in Harlem. That one person was Miriam, and so I will play for you a piece called Meaty's View. So just bear with me and I'll switch over. Oh, Josue, if you can enable screen sharing. And if not, I'll, we can come back and I can play it, but I'll end with that when there's time. Thank you. I mean, I can play it, so I'm gonna play it on your behalf. Is that okay? That's that's perfectly fine. I'll tell you when. Um, the time mark is about one minute, 36 seconds. This is called Midi's View. I'm going 
was a city or a community, a space of people of various tools and this very dark to very light. Anything north of 96th Street, everybody was colored. Thank you so much. Um, and now we're going to move on to uh, Ryan Mann Hamilton. Unmute. Hello, hello. Hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, yes, Ryan Mann Hamilton here. And thank you again for the invitation to be part of the celebration of not only the reader, but also the forum, of course, and then, of course, of Miriam Jimenez Roman, who has been so important in so many of our lives. Um, I'm lucky enough to call Miriam and both, well, both Miriam and Juan good friends, mentors, um, to have been part of the development itself of the Afro-Latino Forum, which was the Afro-Latino project uh, beforehand, as Kwame mentioned, and also to have been included in the Afro-Latino Reader as well, a very small piece around my own history of African-American migration to what is now Samana, right, in the Dominican Republic, and thinking through those different movements themselves. Um, so I guess I'll start with a story, right, in terms of think, thinking about how I met Juan and Miriam. Um, and that was first in 2005, right? So it's been a while, 15 years at this point. And I met them at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity that was being held here at New York. And at that point in time, I was actually out in Northern California at Humboldt State University teaching and, and doing my own master's work. Um, and I remember at the presentation, right, they were at that point, it was still the Afro-Latino project. And it was the first time that I'd ever heard um, someone talking about my own story, right, in that way. Coming, having been born in Puerto Rico from right, a Dominican mother, 
uh, of African American uh, heritage and everything else, right? There was a lot of confusion, a lot of not knowing, a lot of uh, not engaging in these conversations in the context of the island, but also in Northern California when I arrived there, right? Um, I arrived there in the tree hugging stage, I'll say that, um, where, you know, a lot of the, um, I would say 90% of the community was white and they would prefer literally hugging a tree over a black person, right? Um, and so engaging in that and sort of, you know, arriving in New York City, one of the things, um, I remember actually going back to what Evelyn was talking about, you know, Miriam, as I told her my story and my story, my history, she said, you know what, you should maybe go up to the Schomburg, right? And on that trip, I went up to the Schomburg and I, I worked in the Jose Vigo collection, which she said, you know, check that out. And that was literally the first time I actually read interviews of my own great grandfather, right? Of, of engaging in that history and knowing. And that was sort of the path that led me then to think about a doctorate, um, which I now have a doctorate, right? But this was all the making and the doing of Miriam and Juan, who pushed me and prodded me in that direction multiple ways, right? And allowing me to share a very small piece of that history in the Afro Latino reader as well. Um, and that's right. And after, after meeting them in that first initial uh, journey here to New York, I invited them out to California to do, uh, I created an Afro-Latino seminar. They came out, they were very gracious. Uh, they were embraced uh, by many of the students themselves as they always are, whatever, st uh, whatever space they step into, right? Um, and they invited me to be part of what at that point was the Afro-Latino project. So I moved, I literally quit my job in California and moved out to New York um, and started with the forum. And from there in my second year in the forum, the first thing that Juan and Miriam both did was to say, you need to go do your own PhD, right? And I think like Kwame, I was not enamored and I'm still not enamored at all by the academy, but I've done it. That's the important part, right? I participated in it. I got through it. And now I do it the way that I want to do it, which is what Miriam and uh, Juan both taught us to do, right? Uh, you insert yourselves into these spaces and you take over those spaces and you make them your own, right? So that's that's the legacy that they have, that have pushed in that direction, right? Um, I also want to talk about the forum, right? Because I think the forum was an incredible experience. Like I said, it started as a project, then became the forum. But even in that transition to become the forum, right, we were all part of that process. Kwame was there, Jima was there. There was a lot of the, the first generation of younger folks who were involved with Miriam and Juan. And then there was a second generation, a third and a fourth, and it continues going. And I think that's part of the legacy, again, that they're also leaving, right? But they've engaged so many young, not only younger folks, but mid-year, you know, mid-career mid, uh, mid academics as well, and even older academics. And they're always so, so giving with their commentary, with their, with their love and everything else, right? So I think to me that's, that's extremely important to highlight when we're talking about, obviously, again, the work of the forum itself, but the legacy of the reader itself, right? Um, and in retrospect, you know, I can think about my fondest memories of, in the forum are really those first few years, right? When we were doing workshops at the New York Poets Cafe, when we were uh, holding small mini conferences at the Schomburg um, Research Center, right? When we were organizing all these different events, because it was something that at that point in time wasn't something new, right? But it was something that was not as, uh, as well engaged as perhaps Afro Latinidad is today, right? Most folks did not understand where we were coming from, why we were doing these things, but it was so personal to us. That's what, why it was important, right? None of us were getting paid to do this work. We were all doing it out of the kind, well, out of our hearts, right? Our desires. We wanted to, but it was because it was our own history that we were engaging with. Um, and these are things that we carry today. I also remember one of our, my fondest memories of the forum is actually, you know, when we actually got to go to Ecuador and hang out with the Afro-Ecuadorian communities, not just on the coast, right, but also in the highland areas themselves. And to see the differences, right, between those different locations within one country, when right? we talk about blackness, um, to, um, to have a comparative lens to talk about discussions of race and racism across different spaces, right, which is something that unfortunately today we still, many of us are still incapable of doing. Um, so. So I think uh, what I just would like to leave right, um, the conversation with is to think about, again, and, and to thank, obviously, Juan and Miriam both for the work that they've done, for the, for the energy that they've put into this process, into us as human beings, right? Not just as academics or as community activists or whichever or, right? They have made this as you know, a process as a family itself. Um, so there can only be love and appreciation for the efforts that they've put forward um, and the leadership that both Juan and Miriam have been a part of, right? And obviously, Miriam still continues to be my mentor. Uh, I speak to her regularly, um, and it's a pleasure, right? And sometimes she said things that, you know, your eyes pop up. You're like, oh, what did you just say? But after you think about it for a moment, you're like, oh, she's right on spot, right? She said exactly what no one would say, but needs to be said. And I think that's a beautiful legacy that she lives, leaves with us, right, in that regard, and, and, and will forever live within us, right? Um, I can't sit through a meeting anymore and not say something, and that's important.
right? So thank you again. Thank you for all that work. Thank you for all your love. Uh, and thank you for all your guidance, right? Without the forum, without the reader, without the work that you have all done, uh, I would not be in this place. I would not have the position that I have. And I would not be fighting the certain struggle that I will continue to struggle because of your legacy. So thank you. Thank you. And so we're actually going to go to Yamila now. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Whew. Uh, so, I know Miriam forever. I know one half forever. Um, so, um, Miriam is my mother's best friend. I don't want to do this. Um, so yeah, so me growing up, Miriam always has been very challenging, extremely challenging. Um, I grew up, you know, always knew that I was a black child, you know, I didn't have to say it, but Miriam was the one who was telling me, you know, you are black. And I didn't want to say it because at the time when I was little, I was not secure enough um, to accept what that represented, right? My practices, obviously within my family, it was a black culture, black Puerto Rican culture. Uh, I was exposed to that, you know, um, but I didn't want to say, for some reason when I was little, yes, I'm black, I would say, um, cinnamon color or um, maybe uh, Hawaiita, but I would never want to, wanted to say, and Miriam was constantly challenging me that, challenging me that. Um, Miriam and, and I had, um, listening to the group, I think um, she has seen me in all my facets of my life, as a young child, as a teenager, and then in college. Uh, unexpectedly, I didn't know that I was going to work with Miriam uh, when I was in college. Uh, I also went to Hunter College, and um, and at the time she was working for the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, and I just happened to have a work study position there, and I didn't know Miriam was working there. So um, I believe a year after after that, I was her assistant working for the Central Journal, and I learned a lot as well. Um, I learned, like Brian mentioned, you know, questioning at meetings um, if something was unjust or not fair. In those little things, um, it was, you know, I was just observing and observing, all, all, you know, the way she would present herself, you know, sh sharp, super sharp. Um, and that's what I believe can be uncomfortable to many people, her sharpness and her directness. Um, I remember when the Afro-Latino project came about, right? Um, I was invited uh, to their house and it was, a group of people, so eclectic, um, um, that was extremely impressive. Later on, um, I didn't continue. And I believe two years after, I believe Ryan and Jima and Kaiti um, and other folks were part of that first generation and Kwame was in, and Amy was part of that first generation of the Afro-Latino Forum. So I believe I joined maybe the second or third year and when I received this invitation from um, Saida and Melissa, I just remember the marathonic meetings that we used to have every Sunday. Um, we used to say, okay, it's going to be from 12 to two. <laughs> and it used to be from 12 to eight. <laughs> and we all lived in many different parts of the, of, of the city. We used to complain sometimes, why they need to be so long? But there was something about the group that we couldn't be away from each other. Um, it was so eclectic, you know, um, you know, Ryan and, and his environmental approach and and always having, you know, something, adult beverages on the side, um, um, Kwame and the music and Kaiti and, 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 and Jima in the beginning, you know, laughing and making jokes, but also extremely smart women. And um, so it was not only a group of intellectuals, you know, we, by by degrees, but we all contributed so much through our own experiences. And I, I think at some point I realized a lot of 
the group that I was in, you know, they all they were all coming to become a pro, oh, a pro coming to become um, uh, doctors, you know, getting their PhD. And I remember I had a conversation with one. I was like, you know, that's not the track that I want to pursue. And he was like, Yamila, you know, that's not the track you need to pursue. You're the person, you're the middle person. You're the person that you understand the, the academics and you're able to translate that or communicate that to, you know, to the masses, right? I said, okay. So I felt like at that point, then, okay, I have a purpose to continue being in this group. Um, I just want to highlight too that um, 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 another memory that I had was um, when we presented the Afro-Latino Forum to um, the group of kids that I used to work with, and they have um, I have a dream in the Bronx. Um, this was a group of kids that were Afro-Latinos. And I felt at that moment that I was doing some sort of the work that Mina was doing when I was little, sort of like planting the seed. You're not going to get it now. You know, just plant the seed. And 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 now seeing them now, uh, most of them saying, I'm Black. You know, I'm a Black Dominican. You know, he said, that's the work that, you know, Miriam did in me that we're in conjunction with the group, we did what we we're doing to the future generation. Um, I remember, like um, 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 Ryan mentioned, the trip to Ecuador. It was just a beautiful experience. Um, you're seeing, seeing all this group of beautiful Black people, Black faces. And then the last thing I remember in that trip was how we ended, it, ended the, 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 the trip with music. And I didn't know how talented um, Kwame was in terms of he got he started playing I don't know what's that called this this instrument he said when did you know how to play this I don't I knew you knew how to play the piano you know and and you'll see how all these beautiful people were celebrating you know our lives our contribution it was a beautiful thing um, this is the work of Miriam the Afro Latino Forum is to my understanding in the beginning is Miriam's vision. And, and I just wanted to highlight that, you know, one supported her vision and that's what uh, a good partner should do. But this is her baby. And um, this has been her life work um, to talk about the black Latino experience in each country, in Puerto Rico, or the black presence in Mexico. Um, and, and then she focused with the black Latin experience within the United States context. Um, she, uh, and then we all, like Brian was saying, we all were talking about, you know, she's talking about our experiences, but this is, has been her life work that other people are continuing. And also to see how the, the term Afro-Latino 15 years ago was sort of like, um, a word that only a few people knew what it meant. And now to see how it's being used almost, you know, on to describe our experiences and now people get it, most people get it. Um, that has been the work that she has done and other people have done as well. But um, I, I'm, to my understanding, um, the Afro-Latino firm did a, a extensive work um, educating people exposing people about our experience. Um, it has been, um, yeah, and, and like something like Ryan said, when we go to meetings now, we challenge people, we correct people, um, we educate people, um, and we educate people in a way that um, that they feel enlightened when they come out of the meeting. Um, so, with that said, um, yeah, it's it has been, and oh, and then to see that it, the the reader is has been a lot of the, those conversations that is a reflection of those conversations that um, um, we have had on on those meetings um, is is a great way to encapsulate that experience. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. And then uh, last but not least, this group is gonna have Josue. Hello, everyone. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, my name is Gessner Josue Perea. Um, I'm actually one of the new uh, newest, I guess, compared to Ryan, Kwame, and, and, and Yamila, uh, newer uh, additions to the forum. It was, um, I remember how I came into the forum in 2009. I was, I had come back from a two month trip uh, in Colombia, so uh, Colombiano, and I was kind of learning more about myself. I had already had this burgeoning understanding of my blackness as I was growing up, and it highlighted more during college in 2009. I remember very specifically uh, with a friend of mine, uh, Naila, she was, she actually was the one who was like, hey, we really want to do this thing. I want to do this event uh, to celebrate afro colombian and that. And I, was, and I was like, I'm down. I was like, I'm down, let's go ahead. But then I was like, I'm down and I only know a little bit. I don't know how to plan a whole event. And I think the Queens Museum had given us so much time and we were like, what are we going to do for all this time? It was like July 3rd or some weird day. It was like middle, no, it was around July 20th. So she, Naila is a great community organizer and I got in a bunch of, of bunch of things. And I just, I don't even remember how I got connected to Juan and Medium. So I was like, oh, you need to hit them up. They can help you. And the, and the forum helped a lot with the first event of what eventually became a, a, a nonprofit called Afro Colombia New York. We were focusing on the, the, the legacy of Afro Colombianos, not only in New York, but mo most importantly, like in, in to the co Colombian cultural landscape and an important part there. And, and then that's how I came to the forum. And I felt so unprepared when I met people like Ryan and Kwame and Ajima and all these people that had done more research on it. I remember coming on, I was like, oh, I got to prove myself. I got to read everything they know and I got to kind of know what they know. And Juan and Medium would give me books all the time to read. And they were like, read this, read that, read this. And I was like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. And I read a lot and trying to keep up and trying to keep up. And that just immersed me in this world of Afro Latinidad, a world that I, did not know that much about. I knew very little about that world um, before 2009 and even after that. And I think what's important for me about the forum and and because I came in uh, like towards the when the when the when the when the book was being released. Um, and I, what became so important about the book about the readers that the Afro Latino Afro Latina reader really becomes this seminal work that provides like a grounding that we didn't have. I know there was nothing like it before. Um, um, there were a few books that discussed kind of these ideas of, of Black Latinidad, but never in this specific way. And I think that what Medium did and what Juan did, they, 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 they forced a niche. There was like a specific, they're like, no, this is going to provide a grounding. And as, as, a, as a Christian guy, there were some, there were things there that were really important to me that were very revealing. And I think there's the interdisciplinary nature of the, of the reader really moves in. That's why it has it, the effect that it has now, because I, I've spoken about this theory with Medium uh, that there's this always this like renacimiento, renacimiento of, 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 of an understanding of Afro Latinidad. Like it's always like it goes and comes and goes and comes and goes and comes. And, and the new people are like, did you realize that this? And do you realize todos estos somos negros and all that? That comes and goes. But I think before the reader, there weren't many books that you could point to as a source for that. Be like, no, yeah, there's things. And what I see now is that, that the reader provides like this grounding, this rootedness that allows us to always go, oh yeah, here's, here's you read this, here's this, here's this, here's that, here's this person working on this, here's this thing working on that. And I think that's one of the gifts of the reader and of the forum. I think the reader and the forum um, are clearly in different venues, but I think to, to say like what, what has been echoed is that they provide this continuation. It wasn't a one-time event, right? This is why we're celebrating it 10 years later with interdisciplinary folks. I work in theology, Kwame works in music, Ryan works in other areas. And in all those areas, it influences everything that we do and everything that we say. And the forum has influenced everything that we do and everything that we say. And we've connected to African diaspora communities throughout the world through the work of the forum. I was more active through the forum over the last few years. And just the communication that we had was really amazing and it's really been, a, been impactful for me. And I think that that's, for me, the legacy of what the forum did and does and continues to do. And for me, what the legacy of what the reader continues to do is that. And that's why I'm, I'm wearing the, the first, the only t-shirt we ever had of the forum here. Uh, I'm very proud to, to have been part of this t-shirt. This is a limited edition, so there's only a few of these left. Um, uh, but I'm really proud of the work that we do. Um, 
um, I, I was just talking about it with Medium just literally a few days ago and how in as movements come up and as the fight for black lives comes up, we always need to go back to people who can ground that, right? Because or else then it's just motion without any grounding. And I think for us as Afro-Latinos, at least for me, personalmente, the reader is one thing that I always point to, right? Where there's this rediscovery of sort of black intellectual intellectual prowess now by younger generations. And I think that the, the reader is part of that work and medium is part of that work. And it's very important for me um, uh, that the reader has done so much to my life. And I think like everyone else, my life has been changed. It's different 2009 when, when I met medium and when I met Juan and when I met everyone at the forum, my life took a different turn. I don't know what it would have been like um, without meeting the forum. So I wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for that insight. And so now we're going to uh, move on to our next um, praise post. Uh, so let's get that one up. Okay. And so our praise is from uh, Afro Descendiente, who says, uh, the book was so important to me, as was the first Afro-Latina uh, Forum Conference in New York City. It made me feel seen and acknowledged. Miriam's unapologetic confrontation of racism and colorism in Latinx communities in Latin America and the U.S. affirmed my experience with scholarly research and concrete examples. The Afro-Latina Reader, 10 years later, is still one of the most influential books to me and grounded me as an intellectual in ways that other texts on the Black Latinx experience were unable to do, so forever grateful. Uh, and so thank you so much for sharing that, Afro-Descendiente. And so now we're gonna move on to our next panel. Uh, we have a panel of scholars who are gonna discuss what the reader did as a pioneering text in an emerging field. Uh, and so it is my pleasure to welcome Danielle Cleland, William Sandy Darity, and Tanya K. Hernandez. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa and Saida for organizing this and for inviting me. I. Um, I wanted to start out just talking about, um, you know, when I started in grad school, I decided that I wanted to be a Latin Americanist. And being trained in political science, there really wasn't the option to study blackness in Latin America. And so I didn't decide that I wanted to do that until later on. Um, and I think that's really one of the more important things about this volume is that it sets, you know, it sets a seminal work, you know, um, as something that we can refer to, to say, yes, right, this work belongs here, this work is important, um, you know, this work is something that can be done. And so once I decided that I wanted to study racial politics in Latin America, I was in grad school kind of floating around trying to find scholars who would be able to speak to that. Um, and so I was in New York um, as a Puerto Rican growing up in New York. I had a lot of uh, friends who were connected to Juan Flores. And so I went to see him at CUNY and um, I talked with him for a while. And he said, you really just need to go see my wife, Miriam. Uh, and so I went to Brooklyn, like many other people, you know, have talked about. Um, and I went to see her. And I remember we sat for hours. Uh, we had never met. Um, over wine, talking about, you know, um, this work and what needs to be done. And she asked me questions that no one had asked me before, but that I needed someone to ask me. She asked me what kind of scholar I wanted to be, what kind of writer I wanted to be, uh, what my role, you know, would be in academia. Um, and I really left there with the most direction that I had had in a long time. Uh, I felt seen by her. Uh, I felt connected to her probably because we're two people that uh, don't mince words. And so <laughs> everything that she said, you know, I, I, uh, I, I appreciated the way that she said them. Um, and I didn't see her for many years after that, but I always kept that visit and her work close to me as a guide. And I remember when the reader first came out, I was still in North Carolina in grad school. Uh, and I went to Duke University Press office to go get the book. And there was so much excitement around its existence that there was finally a volume that spoke to our experiences as Afro-Latinos, so much so that I actually remember the experience of getting the book and where I was. Um, and so 10 years later, I still go back to this volume. I still find parallels to so much of the work that I do, um, that my colleagues do. I always assign the articles in my classes. and. 
it still provides this conversation that I think people are still not having, uh, both in the classroom and also as scholars. And, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm in Miami. And so I have a much, you know, different experience than the one that I had growing up in New York. Uh, here in Miami, I'm constantly reminded of my race. I'm constantly reminded that I am black. Um, I'm constantly reminded that we see Latinidad as white. And so this reader is really important to show to my class and to discuss with my class. And many of them, you know, Eduardo's not here, but, um, you know, he's another one of my mentors and he, you know, uh, his article, you know, my students will still say, well, I don't know. I think maybe he might be un negrito complejo, you know. <laughs> and so we still have to go through, you know, the work of race, right? And, and the way that blackness functions within our communities and the importance of recognizing racism. And so, you know, to me, the, the reader is not only salient, you know, for the scholarship, but it's salient for the students. It's salient, you know, as, as Tiana talked about. Um, and so, you know, the beginning of the book talks about Afro-Latinos bridging several communities. Um, but as Afro-Latinos, we also are excluded from several communities because we don't fit into this mainstream idea of what it is to be Black, what it is to be Latino. And so much of this work and so much of the reader is about expanding those definitions, expanding our methodologies, looking at the way that different disciplines are talking about these issues, um, and expanding just our understandings of what race and ethnicity are. And so for me, as a political scientist, Latino politics, you know, my work and the work of this reader, right, pushes folks that are studying Latinidad in the U.S. to really think about Blackness. Uh, which, right, we, we don't um, as a, you know, as a field. Um, and so thinking about Blackness, you know, is what I've dedicated my work uh, to. And I owe a lot of that to Miriam and, you know, being able to, you know, visit her and understand that this is work that needs to be done. Um, and just because not many people have done it doesn't mean, you know, that that is, right, the imperative. Um, and so, you know, right now I'm, I'm, you know, this is a foundation for uh, the work that I'm doing here in Miami, looking at racism within the Latino community, racism within the Cuban community, and, and how blackness, right, within our communities is excluded, is marginalized, um, is invisibilized in so many ways. And so, you know, now, you know, someone else mentioned this, now we're, we're it's trending, right? Afro-Latinidad is trending. Um, but really, we've always been here, right? We've always been here. Uh, these issues have always existed. Uh, racial politics within our communities has always existed. Blackness has always been here. And so, you know, that's why this, this volume to me is so important because, you know, just because we're just talking about it now doesn't mean that we haven't always been here and Miriam had always had that vision. Um, and so I'm grateful to her for that. I'm grateful to this volume for that. Um, and she continues to serve as, you know, my guide and this work um, because, you know, this is this is what we have to do, right? We have to keep um, keep pushing this and and keep uh, putting our fists up and, and talking about blackness. So, thank you. So I'm very glad to be part of the celebration of Miriam and Juan's extraordinary contributions and the important role that the Afro-Latino reader has played. Um, Miriam has been unbending in her friendship and she has been unbending in her integrity. And I really, really appreciate having the opportunity to be her friend because she shares my debater's soul. Uh, so uh, Miriam, thank you so much. Um, and also, I, I think uh, Kirsten and I would like to jointly thank Miriam uh, for inviting us into the Afro-Latinx uh, scholarly community, uh, because we, we are not actually Latinos. So, um, in spirit. <laughs> So, so we're very grateful for that. I'd also like to mention that Dan Danielle was a student at the University of North Carolina in graduate school when I was still there. 
And uh, Tanya Hernandez and I uh, first met at a Black Scholars alumni event that was held at Brown University, where we're both uh, alums, although I'm of a much older vintage than, than, than Tanya. Um, I want to talk about something a little bit different today. I, I want to talk about the whole question of uh, the conditions under which people identify as Black. And I think it's really, really significant that the work that uh, Miriam and Juan has, have, have done on making a commitment to the connection between Latino identity and Black identity uh, as something that they forged at a point before there was any measurable material advantage to associating oneself with blackness. So it, it again, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a measure of integrity. Uh, I'm thinking about, for example, the Brazilian case where uh, large numbers of individuals now will declare themselves to be black in the aftermath of the availability of affirmative action programs. Uh, but I'm also thinking of the, the immediate example of uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, which uh, you know I, I find to be very striking because on February 15th, 2019, she said, I am a descendant of all sorts of folks. That doesn't mean I'm black. That doesn't mean I'm native, but I can tell the story of my ancestors. As of two days ago, she now says, I always say Latinos are black. We are Afro-Latina and we run an entire racial spectrum. I, I presume she means we run an entire color spectrum, but she said racial spectrum. And so the question that I have is, uh, what are the circumstances in which we have to set some sort of boundary in terms of the authentication of whose identity is valid? Uh, what are the circumstances under which people declare themselves to be within the black orbit? Uh, and, and whether those circumstances are opportunistic or otherwise. Um, I think that this is a direction that we're going to have to take both for political and analytical reasons as we move forward in exploring uh, Afro-Latinidad. So, um, so I'll stop there. Uh, but uh, I, I think that there is a serious question that's involved with uh, the conditions under which people self-identify. And I think that means it's my turn now. <laughs> Hard acts to follow. Um, but I have to say it is a great pleasure to be here. And I feel very honored. Um, it, it, Miriam's fans are legion. And it is um, quite difficult to be get on the list <laughs> to honor her. Um, so first, let me just simply say that um, in thinking about how pioneering the book was uh, at its time 10 years ago, for me, is almost immaterial because of how pioneering it is still today right. uh, in 2020. Um, it's pioneering. There's no other book like it in its academic rigor in its breadth and its realness, uh, all of which one could say of Miriam herself. Um, so let me spin a couple of words about what I mean by this, about the breadth and its academic rigor and its realness. It is astounding, right? The way in which with the explosion in attention now to Afro-Latinos and Afro-Latinas on social media, for instance, um, that this book still stands out because the explosion is a real cultural explosion. It's a very identity specific expression explosion and not so much one of academic rigor. There are exceptions, um, but for the most part, this book is alone and it stands out and it guides everything that we do uh, in the field. Um, its breadth is incredible. The book has poetry. It has political scientists. It has economists. It even has the lone law professor, <laughs> myself included. Um, and the reason I think for the breadth is because of the way in which its principal editor, Medium, uh, is like an encyclopedia herself. I mean, the breadth of her literature 
knowledge, how literate she is across multiple disciplines is really so impressive. Um, and it's not though just that she reads a lot, right? It's also that she is activist and how she will seek out knowledge, not only what's published, but what she wants to see produced. And she's activist in the production of knowledge. Um, so it brings me back 25 years ago when I was a baby law professor and I wrote a little letter to the editor uh, in the New York Times, a letter, not an op-ed, right? just a little letter. <laughs> and Miriam tracked me down. She liked a couple of things that I said in there about Afro-Latino, Afro-Latina identity, uh, and its impact in thinking about issues of racial mixture in the United States today, or back then, 1995. And she tracked me down and she said, you must come speak to me. <laughs> and I went to Mecca. I went to the house in Brooklyn. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. It was a, an incredible conversation. Um, and I've only grown since then. Now, she is also one who encourages people way beyond just the beginning of their careers. Um, I met her when I was already in law teaching, um, but she said to me, you need to think bigger than just what you're doing in law. Um, and she encouraged me to be part of the Schomburg Center, to be one of the fellows, uh, to be interdisciplinary in my approach. Um, and the year I spent the Schomburg with her as a director of the program was phenomenal. Now, Rigor. Anyone who's ever had a lunch coffee meeting with Miriam knows that she is exacting in what kind of coffee she will drink and what kind of food she will eat. She does not suffer fools gladly and she does not suffer bad food or bad coffee. That's just the tip of the iceberg as how she is in her examination of people's writing and their research. Um, and even if the piece is a reprint of a previously published um, article, as mine was in, in, in the reader, Miriam still had notes for me and edits. I'm like, Miriam, this thing's a reprint. I'm not supposed to be tinkering with it. No, 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 no. You will edit this. You will answer my questions. And the questions, of course, only made the article that much better. Um, and so I just want to close with the time that I have uh, remaining uh, to say that the book is still a constant resource for me. I mean, here's my copy. <laughs> you might be able to see from the screen all the different dog gear pages uh, and its little weathered beaten treatment. Um, it's love that makes it so beat up because I still go back to it all the time. It's almost like one of those spiritual texts where you're like, wait a minute, that was in there all the time? And you're just rediscovering it over and over again. Um, but then I have to say that in my research, it is still like my Bible. Right? Uh, I've got a new manuscript. I'm sure Miriam will have a critique about the work in progress title. Oh, there's my timer. Let me turn that off. Um, the top, the uh, work in progress title is on Latino anti-black bias, racial innocence, and the struggle for equality. I'm sure she'll have some critique for me on that. But much love and thank you. And it's such a joy to be here as part of the celebration of the 10th anniversary of the reader. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, and so we're going to move on to our just next quick uh, praise post. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is from Miasi P, who shares both Miriam and Juan came to talk at my undergrad. It was a PWI over 15 years ago, and they changed my life. It was the first time I heard the term Afro Latino, Latina. It was the first time I felt understood and it inspired me to rediscover our history. I will forever be grateful for the knowledge that they have given me and others. And so thank you so much for sharing me, ACP. Uh, and so our final panel is uh, comprised of junior scholars who will share how they're building upon the work of the reader and where the subfield of Afro-Latinx studies is going. So it is my pleasure to welcome Pablo Lopez Oro, Claudia Garcia Luis, uh, Yomaira Salas Pujols, and Omari Zamora. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm incredibly grateful for this space, for the celebration, for 
the reflection of how can 10 years have passed so quickly. Um, thank you so much to Melissa and Zaire for um, inviting me to have this conversation. I'm really um, just honored and meaty. I love you. Um, and thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to actually start my reflection and, and kind of thinking about the future of the Afro-Latino reader and its impact um, with the moment I meet Medium and Huang in the flesh, uh, which was spring 2007. Um, and to be quite specific, March 1st and 2nd of 2007 at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, which was hosting the first um, Afro-Latino working group conference titled Beyond Visibility, Rethinking the African Diaspora in Latin America. Um, and I want to give a shout out in terms of just intellectual genealogy and the mapping of that, but thinking of the founders of that working group, uh, Vielka Cecilia Oy, who also has a piece in the reader, uh, Tiana Pachel, uh, Jennifer Jones, and Petra Rivera um, Redu. So thinking about just the intellectual impact of the reader before and even after, right? Um, thinking about how the reader has been this culmination of a text that Miriam in particular has been engaging since the 80s, right? From her times in SUNY Binghamton and thinking about that political labor um, and intellectual labor before even the reader becomes the book, right? Um, so I wanna give that shout out. Um, but in particular, it was a moment that really um, shapes me intellectually meeting um, Miriam, particularly um, both of us being New York City, born and raised Black Latinx folks, but also particularly around this notion of Black Latinos in the United States, which I think is what the reader for me cemented, right? There's There's been a field of Afro-Latin America, right? There have been texts, right? Um, at this point in 2007, we know that Black people exist in Latin America and in the Caribbean, right? Um, however, what I think the, the reader has done intellectually is push us to think about well, what are those hemispheric migrations of Black, uh, Spanish-speaking Black communities coming into the United States, right? Um, and thinking beyond even the notion of Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, right, as this kind of quintessential moment in New York City, but thinking about the South, right, and how the U.S. South um, has um, not only a geographical bond to Latin America and the Caribbean, but thinking about Blackness hemispherically. So I wanted to just meditate a little bit about um, how uh, the reader and the possibilities of the reader really helps us to think about um, Latinx folks of African descent and really push this notion of Blackness, right? Um, particularly that, um, you know, one of the, the, the racial, racial discourse legacies and, and how white supremacy in Latin America and the racial discourse of mestizaje really functions is that in the case, at least, of Central America um, and Central America's Caribbean coast, it not, it not only marginalizes Black people, but it actually negates Blackness. Right. So the way Mestizaje is constructed in, in the nation states of Central America, Black people come from somewhere else. They're not part of the nation state. Right. So to be Afro hyphen Honduran um, is actually a radical notion. Right. Because the Honduran part is never Black. Right. The Guatemalan part is never Black. Right. Um, so thinking about how the reader really helps us to trouble the nation state, right? And, and, and a certain kind of national, ethno-racial nationalism that comes with Latinidad. Um, I'm really hopeful about the future of, of the field of Afro-Latinx studies as uh, not someone, you know, as someone who's like literally defending their dissertation Monday via Zoom at 11 a.m., um, but also entering into Africana studies and making an intervention, an intervention that Miriam and Huang have been doing for decades now, but thinking about pushing back on ethno-racial nationalism, right? So wanting to think about how can we think about Afro-Latinidad without re-inscribing um, certain notions of ethno-racial nationalism, right? Where, why does the nation state continues to be a stubborn presence? Um, when we think about Afro-Latinidad, and I'm hoping that the future of Afro-Latinidad is one that always censors Blackness, right? Um, and always interrogates Blackness into this ethnic signifier of Latinidad, right? And I think we're in a particular moment where um, even the conversations around Latinidad, because of the reader 
and, and the presence of the reader in social, me in social media, as uh, Tanya pointed towards, really is shaping the conversation, right? It's really um, helping us have a conversation that really interrogates uh, Blackness into Latinidad. Um, I still do worry about how Latinidad is still understood to being non-Black, right? That how, Latin, how Blackness within Latinidad remains an addendum, main, remains a footnote, um, rather than thinking of Blackness as fundamentally part of Latinidad in a very kind of anti-mestizaje way, right? Like, not about y tu abuela donde esta kind of situation, right? But thinking about Blackness always being present and, and Blackness being part of the future of Latinidad, um, not some romantic African past. Um, so I'm thinking um, so much about how Miriam and our, you know, as everyone shared our conversations, um, Miriam, in fact, actually pushed me to think about Garifuna folks in, in, in New York City in particular, right? So at this time in 2007, um, I naively thought Latin American studies was a place, oh, great, I can do research on Black folks in Honduras, I can do, you know, I can do this work of Blackness and the scholarship of Blackness in Latin America, not really actually realizing that Latin American studies wasn't it, right? It just wasn't the intellectual space to do that work. Um, and Miriam really, in fact, I'm in forever in debt to, to all of our conversations, to the reader in particular, um, she brings into the fold Central America, right? She's thinking about Blackness hemispherically. She's thinking about Black Central Americans in the U.S. Bielka, um, who is the daughter of a Creole woman from Bluefields, Nicaragua, a daughter of uh, Colón, Panama, uh, West Indian migrants. She's talking about being a Black Nicaraguan, Panamanian, Latinx woman on the West Coast, right? So Miriam's vision, um, and, and quite honestly, hemispheric vision of Blackness, and, and particularly Black Latinidad, as something that's always, always very present, but is always in every corner of the Americas. Um, and that's something that I particularly um, always really gain so much from the reader, and I hope that um, as new generations of Black Latinx scholars, Black Latinx scholarship continues, um, that we continue to always center Blackness, interrogate Blackness, right? And a Blackness that isn't bounded to nationalism, right? A Blackness that isn't bounded uh, to even cultural nationalism, right? So even thinking about how do we even disrupt notions of the hyphen, right? From Afro-Puerto Rican, Afro-Honduran, Afro-Colombian. What is that? What is the violence of the hyphen still doing? Um, and is it really disrupting the nation state rather than uh, finding some type of inclusion into a project that never included Blackness to, to begin with? So thank you, Amiti, for all of that. Buenas tardes. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here today. Uh, I, Saide began uh, by saying that the Afro-Latino reader was transformative, that had a transformative power, and it opened minds. And that's exactly what it did for me. Um, she, The conversations that I've had with Medium and being in the room with Saide and with Nancy Lopez and other mujeres uh, was both uh, deeply um, humbling and also educational. So uh, what the reader did for me in many ways was helped me understand that as a non-Black Latina, there was a lot of responsibility that I had in terms of educating myself and also centering the voices of so many scholars, Afro-Latina women in particular, who have done this work for so long. Um, I grew up in Oregon, and in Oregon, the notion of who Latino is was very different than what it actually is. And so I had to relearn and unlearn what I had been told, um, taught in schools of this ahistorical account of who we are and how we contribute to the oppression within our groups. And so um, I had to come to a reckoning of who I was, and it was through the reader that helped me understand that I, I was robbed that many of us are robbed, but we still have the responsibility to educate ourselves and to push the field. Uh, I am in the field of higher education and in higher education, we are light years behind when it comes to understanding individuals and how racialization impacts us in, um, in schooling. When it comes to Latinos, we are uh, mestizos, and that's who we are, and there is nothing beyond that. That for Latino, made, that for Latino reader helped me uh, question uh, and be pissed and be upset that we had been taught a history that did not include our Black brothers and 
sisters, that in Mexico, Mexico was and is who it is because of our Black legacy. Uh, I had to unearth history that hadn't been taught to me. And then I had to bring that to my home. And I think that that's what the Afro-Latino reader did and what Medium's legacy is. And people shared stories of the transformative um, experiences that she had. And I came to the Afro-Latino Forum in 2015. So I haven't had the pleasure of being involved with them for this long. But what I have come to understand is that as a non-Black Latina, I have the responsibility to sit in a room to listen and then to disrupt colorism and prejudice that takes place in my communities to cite people that are doing the work that has been done for generations but when someone who is lighter skin publishes that work that's the person being cited so it has helped me transform my scholarship I have the responsibility to disrupt what has been taking place place in, in education when it comes to the representation of Latino, Latinx individuals, it is not someone who looks like me. Um, when it comes to uh, the, the transformative power of the words and consejos that um, I have received from Medium, uh, it changed my life and it changed the life of my family. Um, so when I think about the influence of the Afro-Latino Forum, it's not just in my scholarship, it's personally, it's spiritually, but it's also within our communities, within my familia and the small sections with my parents who did not have a higher education degree. They have a third grade and sixth grade education, but it has been in conversations with our familia where we have disrupted colorism, where we have disrupted um, this acknowledgement and, and leaning towards to, ay, que bonito, está bonito este bebito, and then just, and calling um, uh, black people, la gente negra, calling them negritos because somehow that is less intimidating. So we have began doing that work within our communities, within our homes, but it wasn't because I woke up one day and said, wait a minute, I need to work with myself it was the influence of the of the afro latino forum it's the influence of the reader it's been the influence of um the black latinas no collective that has that i continue to read the blog post and say oh my goodness i have so much work to do so i would say that for me it's an honor to be here today the the work continues the work has been done by Black folk. The work has been done by Black Latinos. And it is people like me, non-Black Latinos, who need to continue to learn, to sit in our discomfort and understand that it's not all in a sudden this is happening. It's that we are part of the process that continues to perpetrate colorist and racist notions within our communities, and we must disrupt that. So that has been the influence of the Afro-Latino Forum in my life, in my personal life, in my scholarship, what I do within my communities and within my home. And I welcome my non-Black, uh, Latino, Latinx colleagues to also have those conversations. And uh, I forget what panelist it was that said, you need to look in the mirror and you need to understand. And don't be afraid to see what you see and to ask those questions and to say, why do I feel this way? Have those conversations. They're hard to have, but we need to understand that the same system that is killing Black folks is the same system that continues to oppress all of us. And if we say and pick and choose certain systems, uh, to support, then in many ways, we're also upholding the oppressor. So thank you so much for, for the influence, for the legacy that, that uh, Juan Flores and Miriam that, that you have created for us. Miriam, I told you that the work that you have done was seminal and you said, no, no es seminal. Yo soy feminista, it's germinal, right? And so that's like the continuous teaching that you have um, shared with us and with the community is something that we are eternally grateful for. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Oh my God, this is um, such a joyful space to be in. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I wanna start, of course, by thanking Dr. Dinsey Flores and Dr. Valle for inviting me to be a part of this panel, for creating this event. Um, these are all scholars that I admire and that I cite in my work. And so it feels so special to me to be part of this group. Um, and so, of course, like everybody else, I also wanna thank Miriam and Juan for their pioneering work and echo everybody else when, I say, when they say that my work would not be possible without them. And medium especially, uh, I have 
I admire so much, right? Because she has shown me what it feels like and looks like to be an unapologetically Black Latina who speaks up and who demands to be heard. Um, I appreciate you for that. And I also appreciate you for bringing us food when we've had those long sessions that, like Jamila was saying, you know, you think are going to last two hours and end up being six hours. And media was always making sure that we uh, were taken care of. And so, you know, I want to start, of course, by recognizing that the reader has laid the groundwork for so much of the study of Black Latinidad. Um, and, you know, when, uh, when they ask me to speak a little bit about how I see it moving into the future, I feel like I'm being pulled in two directions. And so I want to talk about both. Um, at first, I want to say that I think its contribution is a call for all of us to recognize that knowledge about Afro-Latinidad is always produced in and outside of the academy, right? The reader um, had uh, artists, writers, scholars, educators, organizers, activists um, as part of the, of the volume. And so I see the, uh, the reader as a continued call to recognize and cite the work that's being done on kitchen tables and Instagram pages and, of course, classrooms, right? Um, and so I think that as academics, we'd be remiss to not highlight how much of the theorizing about Afro-Latinidad happens um, on the ground, right? Happens on social media. I think that's one of the most important parts of, of doing this work. Um, it happens on uh, city blocks and in baby showers. Um, and so there are some new emerging studies that are speaking about the fact that young Latinx people, especially in New York City, are more likely to identify as Black than older generations. And I think that there are some exciting possibilities there to really think about and understand understand why is that happening, right? Um, and so I do a lot of youth work with uh, and research with young Afro-Latinas in New York um, who are able to see and recognize themselves and talk about racism and Afro-Latinidad in ways that I didn't name until much later, right? And so to me, that's very exciting. And I think a lot of that happens through the social media platforms that these young people are engaging and, um, and, and, loving and highlighting themselves right and so i want to i want to highlight here a couple a, a couple of those right black latinas like janelle martinez of ain't i latina and also uh concepcion de leon who's writing at the new york times right like these are people outside of academia who are doing really dope work around Afro-Latinidad and um, who are theorizing it, right? How it is lived on the day-to-day. -day. Uh, young people are being attracted to that. And I think academic, as academics, we can learn from it. Which brings me to my second point, right? And I, I think the reader cracks open our ideas about how scholarship about Afro-Latinidad is produced, right? I think it raises questions for those of us that are doing this work to think about what are the best methods that we need to quantify, identify, and make sense of racial inequality within Latinx communities. I love that Sandy Darity earlier mentioned, like, what are the contexts, right, in which Black identity sort of forms? And so I would like to see more of us seriously take up this work of understanding how uh, how do we use an Afro-Latino epistemology in our methods, right? And so I have a couple of suggestions for how to do that because I've been working with the forum um, and we've been thinking a lot about how, how do we collect data about Afro-Latinos in the United States. And so first, I think there's a tendency in academic work um, to give very little thought to race questions, right? And so what I mean here is that a lot of times academics are just sort of copying and pasting um, race questions that that are used there somewhere, right? Without really thinking about the context or, or the objectives of their study, right? And so there are too many generic racial identities that are just not set up to understand and highlight Afro-Latinidad, right? Um, they are not thinking about uh, the terms or the order or the racial choices that people are being given. Um, and so I wanna point to the reader and the forum because they are making sure that we are not only counted in scholarship, but also in the census, right? Uh, the second piece of it, I think, is that uh, we, race scholars, uh, but those of us who study blackness and Latinidad in particular, I think we should be asking whether we're interested in analyzing racial identity as a sort of personal relationship to race, or whether we're interested in identifying and highlighting inequality. Right, because I think those are two very different things um, that often lead to confusion around this whole idea that Black Latinos don't identify as 
black, right? And so again, here I'm thinking about my work with young Afro Latinas to highlight that like these young girls have always moved through the world as black girls, right? They've always sort of had comments and experienced discrimination and racism, both within from Latino from the Latino community and also from other communities, right? But that maybe their understanding and naming of these terms doesn't come until later, right? And so what I'm saying here is that I think the reader pushes us to understand the fact of race, right? Um, how it is lived on the day to day. And I'm drawing here on Miriam Jimenez Román, of course, uh, Eduardo Bonilla Silva, Nancy Lopez, who's thinking about street race, and cited in C. Flores through Black Latina Snow, who said the census is not therapy, right? And so I want to close here uh, just by saying that I believe the reader really pushes us to recognize that our existing methods have for far too long ignored and misrepresented Black Latino lives. Um, we need new methods and we need new questions and we have to support the people who already know and live this work. Thank you all. Hello. I am very thankful to be here. Um, thank you all for the invitation to be part of this amazing conversation and celebration. Um, and I wrote some remarks, so I'm just going to stick to them so that I can stick to the time. But it, it is very much in conversation with what other folks have already said um, and an iteration of that, right? And thinking about, right, what is the future of the now and the future, I guess, for me, of Afro-Latino studies and particularly um, the reader. Um, I read the Afro-Latino reader while I was finishing up college, uh, 2010, 2011, and it was a gift from one of my best friend's mother who had been, uh, sorry, I don't know what's going on back here, um, who had been neighbors with uh, with Juan back in California, back in the day. Um, and at the time, you know, it gave me language to the experience that I knew, but I had no words for as a working class Black Dominicana who was growing up in Chicago's Humboldt Park neighborhood, which was predominantly non-Black Puerto Rican. Um, fast forward, I met Miriam and Juan in 2013 at a conference at UT Austin where I was a grad student. Um, where Miriam's remarks at the conference really stood with me and created a space at the conference and for me, right, to understand, as she said, and I quote, this is what she said, how, you know, something about how the Americas experience us and how we experience the Americas, right, as Black Latinos, end quote. Uh, meeting Miriam and Juan along with engaging the work has reminded me time and time again to be true to myself and my community and that is what I strive to do in my work as a scholar who's preoccupied with highlighting Black Latino popular culture through literature and media. And so that brings me to a little bit of the conversation that I want to kind of instill in today is that, you know, in a time where the term Afro-Latino has emerged in mainstream culture as a nomenclature that identifies the African diaspora within people in the United States of Latin American descent, it also seems that we're at a time where people like to depoliticize it. Um, for example, I've encountered non-Black Latinos claiming Afro-Latinidad as an identity, as Darity pointed out earlier. Yet I look at them, and this is common, right? I look at them and I'm certain that their bodies are not policed or surveilled within those Latino spaces as say mine or other visibly Black Latinos. When Puerto Rican Bronx, Bronx rapper Fat Joe says in an interview, we are all black, or when white Latinos say I'm Afro-Latinx too, they are invisibilizing and minimizing the social, economic, and violent everyday realities of visibly black Latinos. When I ask why or how is this happening, my scholar friends remind me that this is normal practices of mestizaje where the racial triage, white, black, indigenous, can be black too. In other words, non-Black Latinos laying claims to Blackness or Afro-Latinidad is another way of reinscribing mestizaje and white supremacy by failing to name whiteness and usurping Blackness as part of their own racially mixed identity politics right, or identity. Here, I am not suggesting that anyone in particular has the authority to decide who is what, but if there is something that Afro-Latinidad and particularly Negritud or Blackness speak to is that 
which is mentioned by the late Juan Flores and Miriam Jimenez Roman in the Afro-Latino reader, where the fact of Blackness, as invoked by Franz Fanon, an experience is central to Afro-Latinidad's definition, right? And I share this with my students, and I have them read this, and it always, right, is something that we always go back to, right, particularly, right, phenomenology. I have come across moments where Afro-Latinidad as a concept and identity discourse is depoliticized and also decenters Black lives. We must not only recenter Blackness, but also the codes that make up what we come to understand as Negro or Black. Sorry, I lost my place. My using of Negro or Blackness is about centering experience, people, memories, and archives that our cuerpos negros create or that our Black bodies create. Our Black bodies are crossroads where archives and knowledge production meet. However, there's also right translation of these lived experiences of blackness or flesh to giving definition to the experiences of blackness, giving the words that is sometimes intentionally left untranslated. Um, to take case in point, right, there's a moment where black diaspora people, right, are at an Afro Latina led comedy show, which I was at. And we share laughter and joy when the loud white Latina in the room who has been overly boisterous and taking up sonic space is told by the Afro-Latina comedian host, mommy, please shut the fuck up already, right? And black people share this laughter and almost pain because regardless of language, nation or creed, they all know too well the way whiteness has taken up too much space, being physical, sonic, mental, or spiritual in their own livelihoods. Yet no one in the room has to explain that, right? The laughter behind that pain is a communication or maroon code of resistance, no matter how transient or ephemeral it might be. Similarly, resisting translation could sometimes also be a way of avoiding death by archivalization in both digital and analog. Not everything uh, that is us must be made in archive to be consumed by others. So the question of what happens then when the narratives of Black Latinos are excavated, replicated, and materialized into cultural production. If we consider the embodied archive a representation of the experiences of transnational Black Latinos, we must acknowledge how that archive reconceptualizes knowledge production and self-making in the face of violence. Furthermore, what does it mean to write and perform the archives our Black bodies produce, right? What does it mean to center epistemology and ways of knowing? Right. Um, and this is something that, you know, I believe that Black Latinas know collective. Right. And with the help of medium that we're doing right in the work that we do. So I feel like we should remember that Afro Latinidad, Afro Latinidad, excuse me, is first and foremost about Black lives, experiences, movement, translatability and untranslatability. Right. And that these things must always be at the center. Otherwise, we risk reinscribing mestizaje and white supremacy. Thank you all so much. Oh, we've got, we've all got so much to sort of digest from today. Um, and so for our final uh, praise post is from Afro Bodhi Domi, also known as Shanti. Um, and so she says, when the Afro Latino reader came out, I pre-ordered it and was so excited to get in the mail. As a young Afro Latina, it inspired me to pursue a PhD in sociology and focus on race and racism among Latinxes. Thank you for guiding me to my passions, Miriam. Felicidades. All right, so thank you so much for sharing that Afro Bodhi Domi. And uh, right now I'm gonna actually pass it over to Zaire. So now we have um, a series a video, a series of um, comments on uh, Miriam Jimenez Roman and uh, the Afro Latino reader. Thank 
This is for my sister friend, Miriam Jimenez Roman. Being introduced to you and Juan Flores and the Afro-Latino reader was an extraordinary gift. As a daughter of the Caribbean, I never imagined that I would find in a single volume such a varied array of voices, not only acknowledging the existence of anti-Black racism within Latino communities, but also challenging the narrow and limiting African-American and English-speaking dominated conceptions of Blackness. I know this was a labor of intellect and love and perseverance. So I offer this poem in tribute. A Center by Hajin. You must hold your quiet center where you do what only you can do. If others call you a maniac or a fool, just let them wag their tongues. If some praise your perseverance, don't feel too happy about it. Only solitude is a lasting friend. You must hold your distant center. Don't move even if earth and heaven quake. If others think you are insignificant, that's because you haven't held on long enough. As long as you stay put year after year, eventually you will find a world beginning to revolve around you. Love you, Miriam. Saludos, eh, mi nombre es Juan Otero Garaviz y estoy aquí pues, para hablar brevemente un minuto sobre Miriam Jiménez Román y el Afro Latino el Reader, que cumple 10 años. Eh, es un libro eh, que, cuyos alcances en la Academia Norteamericana yo no estoy eh, eh, preparado para hacerlo, ¿no? yo solamente puedo hablar de los alcances que pudiera tener para la Academia y los, entre la cultura de los pueblos en Latinoamérica una vez se logre traducir el esfuerzo que nosotros debemos dedicarnos, ¿no? Eh, mi esfuerzo con Miriam, mi conocimiento con Miriam, se estrechó a la misma vez, a la vez que estaba traduciendo los ensayos de Juan Flores, que condujeron a Ugalú y otros misos, eh, cuya, el, el, el desarrollo de amistad que hemos mantenido, pues, a lo largo de más de 20 años, eh, y en los cuales Miriam, pues, nos ha logrado, nos ha llevado a comprender muchos ángulos, a traer muchas historias, ¿no? De eh, las experiencias de los afrodescendientes en y fuera eh, de Puerto Rico y la comunidad académica. Eh, el afro latino es un esfuerzo que debe mantenerse eh, eh, y desarrollarse. Por suerte ahora en Puerto Rico por fin se está, va a comenzar a un programa de estudios de raza que eh, seguramente va a interesar a muchos eh, y muchas eh, personas y estudiantes y académicos eh, y que yo espero tenga no solo redundancia no solo en la universidad sino también en la sociedad puertorriqueña cuyos problemas raciales son tan agudos y tan ignorados así que eh, espero que eh, eh, el afrolatino logre su traducción eh, eh, y mayor su difusión y el foro siga manteniéndose eh, y, y manteniendo sus redes y difundiendo sus redes eh, y eso es todo muchas gracias Hey, happy 10th anniversary. Eh, bien emocionante saber que ya han pasado 10 años eh, y que este libro sigue siendo trascendental para muchos de nosotros. Y mi, la, una de las mayores aportaciones que me han dado eh, Miriam y Juan en más de 20 años de amistad ha sido la oportunidad de decir lo que pienso y que se ha tomado en consideración como parte de esta gran experiencia that uh, Miriam was so uh, affectionately rigorous uh, in putting together uh, and for me you know that question that Miriam always asked I was meaning to ask you about that sentirse uno que, que esto es un tejido y que estas redes eh, tienen tanto, 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 le deben mucho a este trabajo y que continúen por más de 10 años más. My name is James Early. I am extremely pleased, excited, and happy to be able to offer congratulations on the 10th anniversary of the publication of the Afro-Latino Reader. 
by my very, very dear friends and extended family members, Miriam Jimenez Roman and my ancestor brother, Juan Flores. Uh, a lot has happened in the last 10 years, and we can look at the Afro-Latino Rita and see well-documented, uh, firsthand, uh, community-based perspectives and accounts of what has unfolded um, in bolder terms. And so congratulations to all, and particularly that generation of students who are now uh, taking their place in universities and organizations and, and social justice activity uh, across the world, literally. Uh, congratulations to you for having been a part of that project. Hi, this is Kim Butler from Rutgers University. And it is just so special to be able to honor the Afro-Latino project on this anniversary. It is also so special to me personally to be able to say to my friend, Medium, that uh, you and Juan created something that has truly, truly push forward the field of Afro-Latino studies, and that is going to stand for many, many, many years to come. It's such a great legacy. Uh, congratulations. Enjoy the celebration, and arriba y adelante. Bienvenida familia, mi nombre es Nancy López y soy profesora de sociología y directora y cofundadora del Instituto del Estudio de Raza y Justicia Social aquí en la Universidad de Nuevo México en Albuquerque. Good afternoon, family. My name is Nancy Lopez. I'm professor of sociology. I'm also the director and co-founder of the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice. And it is my great joy to um, speak to the importance and the transformational impact of the Afro-Latino Reader celebrating a 10-year anniversary. It has been a source of joy and visibility for the Afro-Latinx community, the Black Latinx community. It is a counter story to the idea that Blackness exists outside of Latinidad. And it's also a social justice movement that seeks to advance equity, justice, and transformation for our communities, our families, our institutions. A large part of this, I think, involves in uh, collecting data on our communities because oftentimes we conflate Hispanic origin and race and instead we should really be collecting data that helps us understand differences in lived experiences mm -hmm. among the Latino community. It also celebrates the art and the culture of our community, the poetry, the music, the um, art, the family, uh, the leadership in social justice movements, as well as the challenges that we've made um, to transform what passes as knowledge and Latinidad. So I welcome the opportunity to um, congratulate the team of work and the leadership of the Afro-Latino Forum that produced this volume for posterity, for a legacy. And I invite all of you to continue the work and build capacity as our communities grow and expand ideas of social justice that center Black Latinx lives in an intersectional way that also center Black LGBTQ, transgender, undocumented, um, disabled, um, Diff different uh, communities across the country as well as across the diaspora. Thank you again and I look forward to the next volume and the next generation for generations to come. Saludos. I'm here to celebrate the incomparable Miriam Jimenez Roman on the occasion of the 10th anniversary publication of the Afro-Latin reader she co-edited with the late Juan Flores. The reader embodies Miriam's lifelong mission to intentionally and unapologetically document the history of Afrodescendientes. Her keen, fiery eye and consistent ability to ferret out unrigorous research 
and calling BS on researchers without skin in the game in the Afro-Latin community they study has kept us all honest and humble as we frame and publish our own research. Like Arturo Schomburg, Miriam follows in a long list of Afro-Boricuas and Afro-Latinas, Afro-Latinos, particularly from the working class, who have fought hard to make visible the lives of Afro-Descendientes. She constantly reminds us that the lives, history, and sacrifice of Afro-Descendientes are complex and legion, and that they have always mattered, and that her struggle, our struggle, shall not be in vain. Gracias, Miriam. Te quiero. So um, it's hard to say a lot more, although there is a world to say about the reach and the impact that the reader and uh, Miriam Jimenez Roman um, in collaboration with Juan Flores has had um, and continues to have. Thank you all for joining us, for sharing a bit of the ways in which the work has um, traveled and been um, shared. Um, thank you especially to uh, Josue Guernes Perea, who um, has made sure that this happened uh, technologically, uh, you know, smooth, flawless ride. Thank you. And Melissa Valle, who um, partnered <laughs> um, with me in um, putting this together. Um, there's no better way, we think, to conclude our brief time together, but hoping that there is ongoing sharing and conversation um, about uh, this work, actually having no doubt that there will be. And then to conclude with the event with uh, Miriam's own words. Um, so I'm going to read from the reader. The way that Afro-Latinas navigate their social identities as they intersect with other Latinos and with other Blacks is unique to them. The fact of Afro-Latinidad to borrow Franz Fanon's phrase, the fact of Blackness makes that experience distinct in basic ways from that of either non-Black Latinas or non-Latino Blacks. Indeed, in a paradigmatic way, this other Blackness is common to all foreign Blacks in the United States, including Africans, Haitians, and other peoples of non-Spanish backgrounds. As these life stories and countless others make clear, Afro-Latina is at the personal level, a unique and distinctive experience and identity because of its range among and between Latinos, Black, and the United States American dimensions of lived social reality. In their quest for a full and appropriate sense of social identity, Afro-Latinas are thus typically pulled in three directions at once and share a complex multidimensional optic on contemporary society. Taking a cue from W.E.B. Du Bois, we might name this three-pronged web of affiliations triple consciousness. To paraphrase those unforgettable lines from the souls of Black folk, in studying the historical and contemporary experience of the United States, Afro-Latinas, one ever feels his threeness, a Latina, a Negro, an American, three souls, three thoughts, three unreconciled strivings, three warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Du Bois' reference to strength and resilience bears emphasis. The multiple experiences and perspectives, including the contradictions, pain, outrage, does not necessarily translate into pathological confusion. As many of the contributions to this volume suggest, 
embracing and celebrating all the dimensions of oneself has not only been possible, but has also resulted in significant innovations at the personal and collective level. It is an example of how what doesn't kill you makes you strong. To be clear, the use of the catchy term triple consciousness is not intended to trump or one-up the African-American particularity and struggle, but rather only to point to the increased complexities of the color line in light of the transnational nature of present day social experience. For when in the souls of black folk, Du Bois so momentously declared the problem of the 20th century to be the color line, he was not speaking strictly of African-Americans, but of quote, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea, end of quote. He recognized over a hundred years ago that these crucial social differentiations were not national, but global in scope. What is new in our new century is not that transnational reach of black experience, but rather the degree to which the global and the national are intertwined with one another and the immense political and cultural implications of this dramatic shift. The experience of Afro-Latinas in the United States and the emergent realities of the new century impel us in tune with Du Bois' critical legacy to further advance an integral global vision of race. And at the same time, to articulate a keener awareness of specificities and internal complexities, both within each group and across the amplified range of groups. Here again, Du Bois' choice of language is of key interest, for in the souls of Black folk, we have the crucial linkage of a class dimension with the heralding of cultural awakening among the oppressed nations and peoples. The word folk, which harbors both a class and a racial reference, holds the key to comprehend the new Black and Latina diversity and to hailing our elusive yet persistent goal, the dawn of freedom. Thank you. 
for coming, for joining us for the Afro-Latino Reader at 10. Uh, this has been extremely generative, I'm sure, for so many of you. Uh, so thank you all to the contributors, the people who I see who are on social media. Things are popping on social media right now. Um, so we hope that this is the, you know, a continuation of a conversation around uh, these phenomenal contributions, but also in terms of thinking about the work that we all put forth in the various sort of capacities that we that we are in uh, in this world, trying to make a difference. So, uh, on that note, enjoy your weekend, everybody. Bye. -bye.